um, we'll get started. Just to begin, this is anaesthetics. Um, I tried to tailor it for stuff that would be relevant and like would come up on exams. Um, but teaching like a one hour talk on anaesthetics is a bit strange because anaesthetics is effectively the management of your physiology. So all physiology comes into anaesthetics. So trying to narrow it down to just the specific things is quite hard. I focus primarily on things like airway management, ventilator settings, and lung conditions, which can be affected by the ventilators. Um, hopefully that's all useful and I've tried to tailor it primarily for like third, fourth year level exam type questions. Um, I go into some detail on some of the drugs that will be used um, as well. So hopefully that will be fairly interesting. And I would very much encourage you to use the chat function, uh, post any questions. I'll probably fire a few at you guys be nice to have some responses because otherwise I'm sat here in my room talking to myself and I feel like a crazy person so it would be nice to have a little bit of interaction uh, stops you all from falling asleep as well and lets me know that um, I'm not alone so with all of that preamble done uh, let's get started so today we're going to be going over um, the principles of oxygenation airway management and then we're going to be finishing on ventilators. Uh, let me move this so I can. There we go. Okay. That would be a great place for this to go. There we go. That's better. Okay. So, as I was saying, an anaesthetist's job effectively encompasses all physiology. Um, Play with all kinds of fun drugs, including sedating agents, uh, anaesthetics, which no one knows how they work, at all, um, and ionotropes. I'm going to try and simplify this down to effectively all you do is optimize physiology after major systemic insults, um, be that during surgery, uh, which is in itself a pretty catastrophic event to the body. Uh, it doesn't differentiate you having a midline laparotomy from you being hit by a car it's just um, the physiological response to it is the same from that point of view it's just a surgeon um, that's able to control damage a lot more carefully during the laparotomy um, so supporting that physiology and ensuring the patient makes full recovery end line like bottom line of that is you basically need to make sure that their tissues are receiving enough oxygenation and perfusion to heal properly and perform their standard metabolism. Everything that's done in anaesthetics is about either controlling pain or achieving that end point of tissue perfusion. So obviously for tissue perfusion and oxygenation, we need to get oxygen into the body around to the cells that then need to use it under correct metabolic conditions and the CO2 needs to get out stop you building up acidosis. So most of the problems that we're going to be discussing in relation to these today will be in principle uh, to do with the lungs because we'll be discussing airway management and ventilators and stuff that you can do about problems that occur in the lungs. Obviously problems can also occur in the tissues themselves and that's where roles such as um, ionotropes come in for cardiovascular support move that blood a little bit better and metabolite management and electrolyte abnormalities come up that all kind of comes along this uh, when we're talking about conditions that cause this in the lungs we're usually talking about vq mismatch um, so that ventilation perfusion differences that basically mean that you can't get oxygen to your tissues one way or another when you have a perfusion problem and when you have a ventilation problem, you get put into a category. And those two main groups are shunt or dead space. So if you have a problem with ventilation, so you can't get gas in and out of your alveoli, but your cardiovascular system is working fine. These are known as shunts. And problems with perfusion, so your gas is going in and out of your alveoli, but you've got no blood around to pick up the oxygen and it's dead space. 
Uh, these two can coexist. One can lead to another. So you can imagine a, a quite nasty positive feedback cycle, but they'll typically present as a condition with just one or the other, and then that might develop into a combination of the two. Okay. This is just a bit of a diagram to illustrate the problem. So on the left here, we have our shunt, where we have this poorly ventilated alveoli, which might be blocked with a mucus plug, for example. We've got our blood coming around, and this side isn't being oxygenated. Back into the pulmonary veins and mixes with any of the blood that has been oxygenated. This decreases the overall PO2 of the blood. So you end up for the same breath, essentially receiving less oxygenation because it's diluting this poorly oxygenated blood that's usually being provided for by an alveol. Physiological dead space, you effectively just remove the blood flow and you have this gas bubble sitting here not doing anything. Um, and so you end up being able to use way less alveoli. Um, obviously it also then decreases your PO2. So to go into a little bit more detail on shunting, um, blood, basically goes from the poorly ventilated alveoli. Oh, this is everything I've already said, sorry. I wrote these slides a while ago. Um, so shunts basically occur from anything that blocks the alveoli. So I gave the example of mucus plug earlier. Pulmonary edema is very common as well. If you're filling up those alveoli with fluid, uh, lung collapse, and pneumonias also when you fill it up with consolidation. So, um, these can exist naturally in people uh, that have problems such as foramen ovale, um, and to a small degree, these are quite well compensated for um, using pulmonary vasoconstriction and things like that in the lungs to divert blood to the active alveoli that aren't blocked. See, the more alveoli become blocked, such as in atelectasis, the less your body's able to compensate for that, and the more your PO2 drops. Um, so you've got the differences between anatomical um, shunts and then physiological shunts. These physiological shunts are things that are caused by pneumonias um, and present themselves as this problem. So correcting these basically doesn't matter how much oxygen you're going to give them. So you could blast this person with 15 litres high flow, 100% oxygen, it would not improve their oxygen levels because no matter what you do, that oxygen isn't getting to the alveoli. So these patients need to have their alveoli opened up in order to get it down into the bottom and take place in the So this is where CPAP and chest video is really useful in things such as proning patients. It moves the gunk inside their lungs around, helps keep the alveoli open to stop them from collapsing, and lets that gas exchange take place. The second part of all the conditions is dead space. So your respiratory system naturally has a lot of dead space. So everything apart from your alveoli is dead space. It doesn't take part in gas. This is anatomical dead space. So your trachea, your bronchioles, all natural dead space. It doesn't take part in gas. Um, However, it does contribute to your tidal volumes. So every time you breathe, you have to fill up your dead space before you get to take part in gas exchange. That makes sense. So to break it down a little bit for you an example. Um, if we have this case of a teenage boy weighing 60 kilograms, in a normal breath, he'll take 480 mil of air into his lungs. But of that, 120 mil is stuck in dead space in gas exchange. Before the rest goes down to his alveoli and takes part in gas exchange, he's still getting a healthy, what, 360 mils worth of gas. However, he then gets sick, starts hyperventilating, so he's going through an asthma attack. Uh, he's now making lots of very rapid but shallow breaths. So his tidal volume drops significantly. Instead of bringing in 480 mils, he's bringing in only 180, for example. 
that 120 mil of dead space doesn't change. So he still needs to fill that before any gas takes part in gas exchange. So now, minusing 120 mil, he's only getting about 60 mils worth of gas exchange taking part. Um, this obviously is nowhere near enough, and what starts to cause the O2, these patients to drop off. So if this patient did have asthma, for example, um, this is compensated for by the rapid rise in his respiratory rate. So every breath is less effective, so he's having to think more. But this then leads on to the fatigue and the exhaustion of respiratory muscles from PaO2 and rise in CO2. So we take this principle of you have to always fill the dead space up. Physiological dead space caused by these conditions effectively extends your dead space. So you're still having to breathe in and fill it up, but you're just adding an extra number onto that gas that can't take part in perfusion. Uh, here's just the diagram again to demonstrate. So these are problems typically caused by pulmonary embolisms, shock, emphysema, lung cancer, anything that messes with your alveolar's ability to take part in that. Um, so typically, uh, heart failure that I've got up on here will cause a combination of the two, because then once you've got the um, pulmonary edema, that's the lead in you get this nasty combination of both blunt and um, dead space. So uh, now we have a pretty good idea of what goes wrong with the lungs, and why you can't get oxygen in for various things. Um, we use something called a VQ ratio in order to tell how well your lungs are working and getting oxygen into your lungs. Um, you'll have seen scans of this before throughout medical training. And um, problems with it are called VQ mismatch, ventilation perfusion mismatch. And they're measured using the VQ scans or by measuring alveoli oxygen concentration compared to PO2. Normal VQ ratios are 0.8. So if you take a scan of someone's lung and they get a general VQ ratio of 0.8, that's great. Otherwise, you literally work it out by just dividing the amount of oxygen that goes in and out of the lung, or air specifically, by the amount of blood that goes in and out of the lung in a minute. So if you end up with problems, um, numbers higher than 0.8, you know typically you've got too little air going in, some kind of shunt disorder. And if you have problems that are lower than 8, you'll have too much blood per air. So um, so this is an average for your whole lung. Um, based on gravity, you'll get different VQ ratios at different points in the lung because of the way gas and blood distributes itself. So if you're given a question at any point that gives you a VQ ratio, always check where, the, where it was taken on the patient. Is it a general one or is it a VQ ratio of the upper lobe? And is the patient standing or lying down? Because if a patient is standing up, we have something called west zones, but if a patient's standing up, you see down here in zone three, gravity pulls all of the blood to the bottom. You end up with very large engorged blood vessels which compress the alveoli. So the bottom of your lung doesn't take part in gas exchange very well and ends up with a skewed ratio. The opposite is true for the top of your lung in the middle where optimum gas exchange takes part and you'll have that normal VQ ratio. Everybody happy with that? Um, oh hi Fraser, are you still here? I did get the survey link. Sorry, just check my chat. Good. Moving on. So those are all the problems that can happen with getting oxygen into a room where it goes wrong. Um, in order to fix it and try and correct these problems, 
give them the oxygen that they need and perfuse the tissues, we need to take control of their airways. So we've got a number of various airway interventions that we can do. I'm just effectively skipping over the adjuncts and maneuvers. I just want to focus on uh, the methods that by protection from aspiration and through which you can ventilate. So on the slide, I have a few pictures of airways, and I would like you guys to let me know which of these provide protection from aspiration. That's a question for you. You can answer in the chat, that'd be grand. Um, the diagram of the larynx is supposed to demonstrate uh, emergency front. So yeah, ET tube does protect from aspiration. And the trachea does, exactly. Um, you can completely bypass the esophagus, so there's no risk. The other one. Um, is a eye gel slash LMI, uh, LMA, laryngeal mask, which um, does also, in a survey, was compared to ET tubes, and it is equally as effective at preventing aspiration. In particularly high-risk patients, um, ET tubes are still preferred, just because of the certainty once they pass the cord, uh, you, and the balloon is inflated, you know that nothing is getting across. Uh, the laryngeal masks, they compress um, the epiglottis, keep um, the esophagus closed off. So they are quite effective at preventing aspirations. Uh, so that's why a lot of the time now, pre hospitally paramedics are routinely intubating with LMAs because they require less training to do effectively and they're still pretty good at preventing aspiration. So it's worth remembering. Uh, cricoid pressure is not really a fail-safe bet. Makes sense because yes, it is effective in theory. You're effectively obstructing the esophagus, but it's not a permanent solution. So because you need to have somebody stood there with their thumb on their cricoid all the time, um, and two, you can't be a hundred percent certain that you've got the right pressure at the right angle that's going to prevent aspiration. So you can use it as an assist when you go to put the ET tube in for that initial preventation, uh, but long term it's not really tenable. But no, thanks guys for the interaction. The others are obviously um, a Goodell, black valve mask, and then standard airway maneuvers, none of which protect them. So that leads us nicely onto intubation. Specifically, ET tube intubation. So, for any intubation, you need to go through a series of checks beforehand. So, you obviously need to go talk to the patient, see if they have any anatomical problems, which is going to make it difficult for you. So, do they have any oral trauma? Do they have any neck or spine difficulties, which is going to prevent you getting them into the right positioning? What does their airway look like? We'll go through gradings of airways later. Um, once you've done that, you can kind of come up with a risk strategy. This is what all anaesthetists will do before operations. Based on that risk, so if they're rated high risk, medium, low risk, and what you're worried about, you'll select the instruments you want to carry out that intubation. So you've got laryngoscopes, video laryngoscopes, fiber optics, and the option of doing awake intubations. In risk patients. So seeing a patient that had radiotherapy um, on their esophagus cause extensive scarring all over the interior of their larynx. It was very stiff and non-pliable so particularly difficult to intubate uh, and there was a big risk that they'd end up aspirating and no one really wanted to do the intubation. So they ended up just um, sedating her a little bit with mendazolam and doing a wake fiber optic nasal intubation with her sat up. So she maintained her own airway. She breathed herself all the way through until the very end. Uh, and they passed a smaller ET tube straight down the nasal cavity, the fiber optic camera. 
that's the safe thing you can do in very high risk zones. Obviously expensive, so always preferable to just do standard if you can get away with it. More and more hospitals now are making video laryngoscopy uh, mandatory or first attempt to do video laryngoscopy. That's to play with on that. But once you've done your risk assessment and planned out what equipment you're going to use, you want to pre oxygenate the patient. So sedate them and using just a bag valve mask, breathe for them with 100% oxygen for a good four or five minutes. And you're trying to empty their lungs of all of the nitrogen that's left there. The purpose of this is it gives you more time afterwards when you're trying to perform the intubation or they deoxygenate and desaturate. Because um, you've actually filled their lungs up with a big reservoir of pure oxygen. Um, so they're not going to tail off immediately and it gives you a bit longer to play with in problems that are associated with saturation. So, um, and then you've got your insertion of the EG tube under Lauren. So going, we're going to go into laryngoscopy and sedation a little bit uh, because there's a few different factors that people like to complicate. I'm going to try and narrow it down to just four to three steps. Um, yeah. So when you take sedation to a patient and you want to do an ET tube, um, you have to both uh, sedate them, provide some kind of pain killer, so usually an opioid, and relax them. If you want to do uh, ET tube intubation, they need a muscle relaxant. Otherwise, their vocal cord will be closed and you won't be able to get an ET tube past them without causing any damage. So, the muscle relaxant's primary purpose is to relax the vocal cords and typically prevent laryngospasm. So, in some patients, if you attempt to do ET tube intubations without adequate muscle relaxant, their vocal cords will slam shut into laryngospasm. And this can be very dangerous and is one of those can't oxygenate scenarios where the patient will deteriorate and deteriorate quite rapidly. Treating it just involves redosing them with muscle relaxants and often trying like better instrumented approaches and irritate the larynx less. Um, trying it sort of apart very quickly. Yeah, so muscle relaxants. So uh, we want an, in so recap, we want a pain medication, typically an opioid, an induction agent, and a muscle relaxant. And that will be the same for every ET tube. The actual drugs that are used are a bit changeable and different anesthetists will use different ones, but essentially they're all doing the same thing. You'll have a pain medicine, you'll have a muscle relaxant, and you have your actual anesthetic agent. Your anesthetic agent can be IV or it can be um, inhaled. So some patients will do an entire anesthetic of inhaled gas, typically done in pediatric patients. And other times it'll just be entirely IV. Other anesthetists will look in that. They're just different ways of achieving the same thing. Uh, your gas. Uh, anesthetics are typically avoided because they lead to a much higher instance of post-op nausea and vomiting. Uh, obviously, anesthetics is very hard to avoid that. You want an antiemetic to be given, but if you're worried about post-op nausea and vomiting, those patients tend to have exclusively IV uh, anesthesia. So. These are the most commonly used induction agents. This is a nice little table. Uh, they'll normally be accompanied, as I said, with an opioid, such as um, fentanyl, pain medication, um, and to aid the induction process. The ones on the list here, a lot of them are quite old. So, uh, Atomidate is basically never used now. I've never seen it used. I've seen thiopencil pencil used once, sodium thiopencil. pencil. Um, otherwise, your two 
big ones are propofol and ketamine. So propofol is the generic, everybody uses propofol, lovely milk colored liquid. Um, ketamine is an interesting one, which is carried a lot now by pre-hospital teams because out of all of the anesthetic agents, ketamine is the only one that doesn't cause vasodilation or reduce your cardiac output. So it's very important agent for use in major trauma scenarios. Typically want to avoid propofol because you're going to further vasodilate them and drop their blood pressure more. Whereas ketamine acts to help maintain that and actually ups their cardiac output slightly. Um, so that's worth remembering. Problem with ketamine though is particularly when they come round, they'll have nasty hallucinations. So um, Monkeys dancing at the end of the bed, goblins sitting on their chest, that sort of thing. So people like to try to avoid it whenever possible because it can be very distressing for patients in recovery. Um, but otherwise, if you're worried about patients from a physiological point of view, ketamine is quite a good option. Um, midazolam isn't really used as a full blown uh, anesthetic agent, it tends to provide a relatively light uh, sedative effect. Uh, and in higher doses, people don't tend to use it, um, see it get used. Um, it's more for um, just gentle sedative procedures such as um, endoscopies. Any questions there at all, guys, with the sedatives? Nope. So after we've got our sedative on our patients nice and asleep, we want to give them a muscle relaxant, paralyze them, open up those cords, and stop them breathing by themselves so we can take over. So there are lots of fun sounding drugs that we uh, that are used to paralyze patients. Um, most of them nowadays have this uh, ronium tendon. Um, they're split into depolarizing and non-depolarizing agents. Uh, almost all of them now are non-depolarizing and have this ronium end. So if you hear something that's got eum on the end, it's usually going to be a paralytic muscular relax. Um, the ones that are most commonly used are usually atricurium, remembering, um, rocuronium and recuronium. Um, Atricurium tends to be used in theatres more, and rock uranium seems to be coloured by um, the pre-hospital teams and people that want to do rapid sequencing in uh, That tends to be because rock uranium has a designated reversal agent, and has a bit of a faster onset time than the other. Our only non depolar our only depolarizing, sorry, muscle relaxant still gets used is a uh, succinothonium, which the brand name for is this at the bottom, uh, succinyl chloride. But uh, that's succinothonium. And depolarizing muscle relaxants are, in, are quite fun because when you see it get used, though it is rare, um, they bind directly to the neuromuscular junction and block it but they have to bind to it first, so they trigger a muscle contraction. As soon as you give the dose of succinothonium, you'll see all of the patient's muscles will twitch uh, in a particular order, starting from the feet and like moving. So small muscles of like the extremities and the eyes, and then they'll finish with the central big muscles. Once all the twitching is stopped, you know they're paralyzed. So it's also a popular choice for um, RSIs or patients with difficult airways because you know definitively when it's acted, whereas the rest, you're not totally sure when it actually takes place unless you check with electrode stimulation of the muscle. Whereas succinthonium, you can look at the patient and you know for a fact once they finish twitching, they're totally paralyzed. Atricurium or rocuronium, it's a little bit harder to tell. Uh, 
Okay. So paralyzing a patient comes with its risks. Okay. So you've now stopped. As soon as you've paralyzed them, there's no going back realistically on a breathing point of view. You need to take over and breathe for them because their diaphragm isn't working. You can't get something down their throat soon. They're going to do something. Um, because of this, people realized you should probably have some ways to reverse muscle relaxant in case. So anticholinesterases tend to get used. Um, common ones are neostigmine or um, uh, let me put this, peridostigmine. Uh, and they essentially just reverse the um, muscle uh, relaxant by flooding uh, neuromuscular junctions with more acetylcholine. So it helps displace any um, muscle relaxants that bind to the more neuromuscular junction and provide more stimulation. They don't act immediately, but they work to shorten the effects of the muscle relaxant. These are used on most of the um, depolarizing, non-depolarizing muscle relaxants. Um, but they're in on locuronium and vocuronium, which are the two which are typically used out of hospital. Uh, they have a specific antidote which directly reverses their effect called Sugamadex. That works by effectively binding directly to any of the drug left in the bloodstream and disabling its function. So it cuts its half life down to zero. And um, almost immediately reverses paralysis after a few minutes. But it costs a bomb, like thousands of pounds per dose. So uh, no one uses it unless it's kind of a really desperate moment. Uh, and it needs to just get shouted at a lot by managers if they use it because it's really expensive. So usually at the end of normal operations, neostigmine gets used, or if it's not been long enough, they'll just leave it and let the muscle relax and wear off by itself. So considering we only have one depolarizing muscle relaxant left that we still use, um, so I'll give it a little bit of love and talk about succinophonium a little. This is our depolarizing muscle relaxant that causes all the twitching, and then once the twitching is done, you know for a fact that it's finished. Um, it doesn't have any effective reversal agent because it binds directly um, to the channels, and it's basically locked in place until it gets metabolized. You can't displace it. Um, so it's not normally a problem. Half-life is about five minutes, and it's metabolized directly in your plasma, by plasma cholinesterase enzyme. Um, the problem comes when a very small percentage of the population have genetic mutations that reduce the function of their plasma cholinesterases. In these patients, um, what is normally a five to 10 minute action of ducks um, ends up lasting hours, so upwards of six to eight hours in some cases. Uh, I think the longest is like a day. So these patients need to be kept. So anyone that's given sucks for an operation needs to have nerve conduction testing done on them at the end of the day, or they're woken up from the anesthetic. Make sure that this hasn't happened. Otherwise, you end up waking patients up while they're still paralyzed, um, effectively causing a locked in syndrome obviously very very stressful and not something we want to do to our patients. So if succinothonium gets used, we'll often see them bring out a fun little gadget and just do some facial like run some electrodes through their face uh, just to see if they can make the muscle twitch and that's not all the stuff is worn off and we don't have any problems with this succinothonium function. So Sucks though really fun to look at and watch all the twisting and useful from that point of view. It does have quite a few side effects, which is why it's not used that much anymore. We tend to stick with the roniums. So 
so it causes problems like bradycardia. And so usually given with atropine at the same time in order to stop that from happening. Um, it causes quite a decent rise in hyperkalemia, upwards of sometimes like 0.5. It's obviously a bit of a problem if you've got a potassium of five already, five to six. Whereas 0.5 is a big change. Um, it's apparently even worse in burns patients and renal patients. Uh, it's a bit of a balancing act because really useful from a medication point of view in renal patients because it's metabolized directly in the plasma and takes no clearance from the kidneys required whatsoever. So it's a nice choice from that point of view to reduce load, but if they're already hyperkalemic, you only need to watch their electron levels carefully if you're trying to prevent it. Um, it's also associated with a rise in cranial pressure and intraocular pressure. And so you can't give it to anybody that's got a head injury or pre-existing basic cranial pressure. And the big fancy one that uh, is the exciting thing about sucks is that you can trigger malignant hypothermia in patients due to a fact that it polarizes the muscles first, depolarizes the muscles before it acts, causes that to act and trigger malignant hypothermia. So you have the genetic susceptibility when your muscles twitch they effectively go into cramp um, due to the succinothermium it can also be induced by some anesthetic gases such as the most well-known cause um, so when they twitch you get this massive raise in intracellular calcium and the muscle contracts and it basically stays contracted it increases its metabolic demand massively you end up with carbon dioxide production acidosis from lack muscle rigidity and hypothermia from all the increased work that you're really doing. Sort of imagining um, a continuous, you, know, you shiver when you're cold, all of your muscles are contracted and it's doing the same thing. So this is bad. This is very, very life-threatening and a rising temperature is actually one of the latest signs. So if you, a patient you see has this and you notice their temperature start to rise, that's actually quite a late sign. And you need to jump on it well, like as fast as possible. A lot of damage has already happened by the time the temperature starts to go up. Um, so early signs, notice an increase in the end tidal CO2, so the amount of carbon monoxide they're blowing out, and they become tachycardic, tachyotonic, and acid. You'll also start noticing these muscle twitches come back. So typically, if you're given succinothermium, they'll twitch and then they'll go flaccid and they are paralyzed. So they won't move anymore. Um, they end up with trismus and masses to twitching um, because the muscles start going to cramp. Um, once you notice that, that's quite an obvious sign that this is about. Um, management, got all of your anesthetic agents that you've been causing it. So if you're using volatiles, gases, we know that those can cause it as well. So stop the gases, make sure that sucks has been, if it's on a in continuous infusion, for example, like that. And then you need to treat this with cooling and dantrolene. So dantrolene just works uh, directly to reduce the uh, metabolic activity of the muscle and uh, bring down the temperature. Alongside this, you need to treat the physiology. So if they've developed an acidosis, correct the acidosis. Dantrolene is your big get out of jail card. Hypothermia, and they love bringing it up on the So worth remembering. Okay, so uh, now we've talked about how to get the tube, uh, well, get the patient ready for an ET tube, because we're actually putting the ET tube into. So I've got a little picture here of all the various grades of airway, um, Cormac grading, which is how you assess uh, an airway for the ability to put an ET tube in. So any ideas what you would want to do to the patient um, 
that has a grade three airway, for example? What can you do to correct that, try and minimize the risks, and make sure that you can actually do the intubation safely? Ideas in the chat would be nice. Be brave, guys. Any ideas? So to get that view, you would have had to put a lamp already. Um, because otherwise you don't get that kind of image. So you put the laryngoscope into the mouth, you've brought their jaw forwards and you're looking down at the airway, but all you get is this grade three picture. Is there anything you could do to improve your view, do you think? Yeah, so always start simple and then progress. Reposition the patient. See if you can, sometimes getting a pillow underneath them. Cricoid pressure is a useful one as well. So yeah, push gently on their throat. Head shield, tin lift. Um, yeah, potentially talk a little bit more later uh, in the next slide about lining of the oral axis. There's more, I don't know if you guys have heard, the sniffing the air, morning air position. So from the side profile, Ideally, get the patient to bring their neck forward and their chin just slightly up. That's why a good way to position patients is to just put a pillow directly under their neck and allow their head to slide back slightly over the top of the pillow. You're a little bit limited um, in some patients if they've got neck problems or arthritis. You can't really adjust the neck so well. I mean, it was a really good starting point. Uh, other things you could do is try to implement it with different instruments. So we could get a video laryngoscope, which has a camera on the end, and see if we could see around a little bit more. We could use a, a, a extra curved laryngoscope, might give us more leverage, or we could use a bougie before we put our ET tube in. Just put the bougie down, much smaller and easier to pass in tiny spaces, and then you slide your ET tube over. If, for example, you get your video laryngoscope out and you're still getting a grade three or a grade four, these are the sort of times where you consider maybe doing a fiber optic intubation or nasal. Make it a little bit easier. Ideally, though, you want to have assessed what kind of view you're going to get before you put a laryngoscope in their mouth. As I said, at this point, you need to paralyze them already. So if you're not prepared to meet a grade four view, for example, you, you paralyze your patient, you get there, and you haven't prepared, you've not got a plan, and you risk it. So a good way to predict what their airway is going to look like when you go inside um, is this Malapati score, which corresponds very well to the Cormac score. So all you do in pre-op, assess the patient, get them to open their mouth, and stick their tongue out as far as they can. And then depending on how much of their uvula you can see, that correlates directly to raise one to four. Really useful and means that you don't have to paralyze them uh, to plan how you're gonna intubate them. So this should be done on all patients prior to intubation so you know what to expect. And then you can take steps to prevent the sort of brown pants moment when you see the grade four and you don't have a plan. Okay, so this is what I was talking about with the stiffening morning air. It's very similar to the head tilt chin lift, but um, you want to bring their neck more forward um, to try and line up all of these axes, basically, and provide you with a nice view. So the maneuvering actually does most of the work, and your laryngoscope, just the last bit, move the epiglottis up out of the way and the jaw forwards. 
most of the alignment is done by head position in the corner. Here you do need to be careful in patients that have arthritis, or mobility issues. Um, it can be very difficult to maintain this position and you risk causing spine damage. So in those patients, uh, you might want to plan using nasal intubation pathways again. We'll assume that you've all done some excellent work, you've lined up the patient well, and you passed the ET tube ET for the first time. Um, you need to check that the ET tube is actually in front. So our gold standard test to know that we've not put our ET tube in the stomach is we want to monitor and we'll see if we get CO2 trace back as they breathe in. Okay, so that's our gold standard. Are there any other ways that we can check that our ET tube is in the right place? Uh, uh, sorry, the gold standard is chronography. So CO2 tracing of the patient's lungs. If you get some carbon dioxide out, then you know it's in the lungs, it can't be in the stomach. Chest rising. Yeah, bang on. A nice, easy visual clue. The chest is rising, in all likelihood, in the lungs. Going alongside with that, stethoscope on the chest tells you a similar thing. Hearing the ventilator and the breath move, you know it's there. Um, however, you can end up, people if you've got really high pressures or an obese patient and it's hard to see their chest rise properly, um, you can't reliably use that method. So that's why capnography was brought in as gold standard. You're always going to get it, regardless of if your patients have a And you cannot progress unless you get a CO2 test. Uh, even when you're resuscitating patients, so this is important. Um, if they, if you can do cardiac arrest and someone tube the patient, lots of the time you hear the myth, or oh, I've been told this anyway, that you don't get a CO2 trace from an arrested patient. And I mean, it's understandable why people would think that because they're not producing any. They're not breathing because um, there will always be still a tiny amount. Yeah, and if you CPR correctly, well, you'll get a capnography trace. So even in arrested patients, you can use capnography. There'll be a smaller graph, not reduced to normal, but it will still be there. So Depending on what's going on with your tube and the patient, you'll get different traces of the technography wave. When you look at ventilator machines, you see those wiggly lines, that's what they're telling you. It's what is happening to the carbon dioxide on its way out of the patient. And based on the shape of the line, you can kind of work out a little bit about what's going on with the patient. So if we have this wonderful, uh, on our top right, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse, but um, on the top right, we have this lovely, normal capnography wave, and then it suddenly drops off, and we have this really weird, jaggedy little waveform at the bottom. That's an example of a cardiac arrest. So you'll still get a trace, but it'll just be really small and wiggly, or you've just dislodged your ET tube. Um, then we've got, if you're carrying out CPR, this is the sort of capnography trace that you get as you're breathing with a bag valve. And then all of the others, we've got this uh, bronchospasm one. So for airway obstructions, you end up with this like sharp fin, hypoventilation, really long sign breaths, hyper, and then this is a sort of Expect to see in like a sleep pattern, doing sleep studies. 
Okay. So that takes us neatly onto what all of the wiggly lines on ventilators mean. Uh, because I know for a fact that most of my training, I was horrifically confused and quite intimidated by these things, full of lots of confusing numbers and buttons that you're scared if you touch the patient will die. Um, so hopefully I'm able to demystify them a little bit. What makes it even worse is that loads, there are loads of different ventilator companies and all of them call what are essentially the same settings, different name. So one ventilator will deliver a positive breath on this setting and a different ventilator will do exactly the same thing, but they'll call it different things. So to try and avoid that confusion, I'm just going to talk about the principles of ventilating modes rather than going into the specifics of ventilating modes. Because otherwise, everyone will fall asleep as well. So we're going to revisit this graph in a bit. And I'd like some of you guys to tell me what's going on with this patient and how the ventilators can set up. Right. So these are the core principles of ventilators. You'll have CPAP and BiPAP, which are our non-invasive ventilators, and then everything else that we've got sitting inside the patient, the EPG is invasive ventilator. The principles of CPAP and BiPAP transfer. So all you're doing with an internal invasive ventilator is essentially the exact same as what you do with BiPAP. So CPAP, as you all probably know, is continuous positive airway pressure. So I am just blowing air directly down the trachea in order to open up the alveoli and deliver oxygen. It's continuous, so the alveoli are always open and always blowing pressure. However, the patient has to breathe in and out at the same time that that positive airway is being, positive airway pressure is being forced down. So this can be quite um, annoying for the patient, uncomfortable, and on the expiratory phase, they don't get any support. They have to work themselves to expire against the force of compression. BiPAP corrects for this and provides an inspiratory pressure to push air in, and then it drops the pressure to allow the patient to exhale. That principle is carried over onto all the internal invasive ventilators. So they deliver a breath with positive pressure, and then they'll drop it down to allow the patient to exhale. So they're not fighting the breath. When they drop the pressure down, they still provide a baseline pressure to keep the alveoli open. That baseline bottom pressure is called peak expiratory pressure. So your peak end expiratory pressure. So it's the pressure present in your alveoli at the end of expiration provided by the machine. So all of us right now, when we're not ventilated, have a peak end expiratory pressure. It's provided by our surfactant and it's what stops the alveoli collapsing when we breathe out. Our peak, expir our, um, peak end expiratory pressure is about um, three, two to three millimeters of mercury, sorry, centimeters of water. Um, patients on ventilators will typically have minimum peak settings of five. That'll be like the lowest peak will go before you start considering taking them off. Five centimeters of water. And that's just the pressure needed to maintain that, keep their alveolos open and stop them from collapsing. So all of the internal ventilator modes are basically designed to provide a breath and maintain peak. So the distinction between BiPAP and CPAP is essentially that CPAP can't give PEEP, uh, BiPAP can give PEEP, and all the internal ventilators can give PEEP and have a little bit more control. So 
BiPAP versus invasive ventilation gives you more control and the power to deliver, to deliver higher pressures to the lungs. Otherwise, our modes of internal uh, invasive ventilation are CPAP with pressure support, which is a, exactly like BiPAP, where we give our continuous airway pressure, force a breath in, drop the pressure, provide the PEEP, and let the patient and then we've got mandatory ventilation. The patient is not breathing at all by themselves or delivering all of the pressure for that breath. Uh, so you choose all of the parameters. So how much oxygen is going to be contained within the air, um, how much air total is going to go, and over how long you want that to be delivered. Those mandatory ventilation modes are split between pressure regulated volume control and volume regulation. That sounds really confusing, but all it means is, are you setting and controlling the pressure of the air that goes in, or are you setting the tidal volume of what goes in? So you do one or the other. So I'll ask for a pressure of let's say 20 as a random example. I'll press go on the ventilator and with a pressure of 20 millimeters, centimeters of water, that will push air into the patient. Then depending on their lung compliance and elasticity, it'll get as much oxygen as it can into the patient at that pressure and then it will drop. If I choose volume control, I pick a tidal volume instead of a pressure. So rather than saying a pressure of 20 centimeters of water, I want a tidal volume of 400 mils. Set that into the machine and I press go, and the machine will then just push whatever pressure it needs to deliver that 480 mil, that 400 mil tidal volume. So volume control isn't used very often because it can be quite brutal on your lungs. The machine doesn't take into any account the barotrauma that you could be causing. If you just set volume control, to say 400, we'll stick with that, and you're dealing with a patient that's got really thick, poorly compliant lungs, the ventilator will read that as resistance and dial its pressure all the way up to max setting in order to deliver that 400 mil. That's obviously going to shear alveoli, cause nasty barotrauma, and leave the patient probably worse off. Pressure control is a lot gentler because you can incrementally increase it until you are happy with the tidal volume. So you set it to a pressure of 20 centimeters, uh, look at the tidal volumes, and you're only getting 300, for example. And you're like, oh, I would like a little bit more. You boost it up to 22, and then you notice that you're getting that pressure. It also delivers the breath over a longer period of time. Um, so it's a lot gentler on your lungs. Volume control is useful, however, in those patients with very poorly compliant lungs, um, particularly boggy uh, patients that are like pulmonary edema or ARDS, uh, because it otherwise using pressure control it can get very difficult for oxygen in, and you, those patients do require those higher pressures. So that's PRVC versus volume control. Everybody happy there, any confusion at all? I know that's um, a little weird, mumbo jumbo, a lot of confusing stuff. Does that make sense? Everyone still with me? You want to say yes or anything like that? Ah, cool. Right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> right, cool. So, no questions, I'm assuming then. Right, so our final mode. Um, 
that we're going to talk about is SIMV. So there are more modes of this on ventilators, but they all essentially follow these principles and are a derivative of one of these. So if you understand these, you understand vents. So SIMV stands for Synchronized Intermittently Mandatory Ventilation. Um, has anyone come across this before? Like to take a stab at um, explaining it for me? What do you think it does from its name, for example? That's got a long answer to try and type in. I'll forgive people for not replying. Um, so SAMV works by plug in the values to the ventilator. You decide if again if you want it pressure regulated or volume controlled and then you decide how often you want the patient to breathe at a minimum baseline so i want my patient to have at least 10 breaths in a minute at least bare minimum so the ventilator goes okay ran i'll make sure no matter what i will give 10 evenly spaced breaths in this next in this next minute However, patients on SIMV will trigger their own breaths. So they will be on light sedation starting to come through. And they'll be breaking out of the mandatory ventilation. Um, light to be put on it to retrain their respiratory muscles. So they'll breathe on top of the ventilator. So they'll get their minimum 10 breaths, but they might breathe and give themselves more as well. If the patient breathes in between the 10 breaths, the ventilator will pick that up as a pressure change and deliver an extra breath to accompany the patient and assist. So it will register the negative pressure as the patient tries to breathe in. Notice that change and provide additional positive pressure to help open up the alveoli and give more tidal volume. Then if the patient over the next minute doesn't breathe, that's fine, it will just deliver its mandatory breath. So some minutes, the patient might end up with way more than 10 breaths, going to say have like 20, 30, particularly if they're a little bit uh, tachypnic. But then other minutes, they'll just have their 10 because of their sedation a little bit. That's SIMV. This also obviously provides peep. All of these, you can change the PEEP setting or the, uh, the pressure, the peak pressure. So you've got your PEEP and your P-PEEK, which are just acronyms for saying your peak end expiratory pressure, so the pressure at the end, which is bare minimum, versus your peak pressure. So what's your pressure at the maximum when you're trying to push all of the air in? You can independently alter those. Okay, those are ventilator modes. We're nearly done with that. This is just a quick summing up of PEEP useful slide because all external ventilators use positive pressure rather than negative pressure which is how we normally like to breathe it does a little bit of funky stuff with our physiology so every time you blow air into the chest you simultaneously decrease um, systemic venous return because you don't have that negative intrathoracic pressure in blood back in um, and they do all things such as uh, preload and arterial blood pressure reserve. Also increase intrathoracic pressure, um, right heart strain, and um, lung functional residual capacity as well. Just bearing in mind anything that adds positive pressure to the chest is going to alter a few things. These are the graphs that you see on ventilators. So now we know a little bit about how the ventilator works, with our various modes and our breaths and our peep. We can look at these graphs and hopefully demystify them a little bit. So if we're using volume control, we'll typically see the graphs on the left. And if we're using pressure control, we'll see the graphs on the right. We concentrate on pressure control. We can see that we have three graphs we have our pressure we have our volume 
and then we have our flow. So the pressure literally just measures the pressure in the circuit over time. So volume measures the amount of gas that's actually moved and over what period of time again. And then flow shows you the in and out motion. So pressure, you can see with pressure control, comes in, nice stable pressure all the way up. We have a plateau, sudden drop back down to peak to allow them to exhale. Volume, we get the corresponding volume increase with that pressure. You see we get this nice slow, gradual, sharp, fin rise of volume, and then there's a drop. They flow we end up with this lovely, wonderful in out peaked cycle of equal inspiration and expiration. Volume control our, in, our pressure does this funky little um, diagonal line rather than going up and down. But what we've done is we've just delivered a load initially to open the lungs up and then because we've increased the compliance the pressure requirement drops off. You end up with this increase in pressure over time to a peak and then it drops abruptly again. Corresponding to that then we end up with this really abrupt rise in tidal volume. So this is quite nasty for the lungs. This rise, this don't have this lovely curve that we would expect from pressure control, drop rise from flow. And then that also is reflected in this flow graph. So in pressure control, as you can see, both inspiration and expiration are equal. In volume control, we end up with this very chunky vertical block of inspiration and then this natural uh, expiration. So that's sort of what all of the squiggly lines on ventilators are showing you. It's the pressure in the circuit, the volume being delivered, and inspiration, expiration graphs. All they're doing. So, with that said, you'll be glad to know this is our last slide. So, can somebody in the chat, or a few of you, explain to me what is going on with this ventilator? So this is a monitor of someone's vents. So what mode are they on? What's going on there? Are they on pressure control or volume control? And yeah, that, that'll probably be equal with that. And what would you like to change? There's a third question. Would like to unmute themselves and talk rather than type it as well. I'd be happy with that. People are brave. Anyone? Please. No. Yeah, it is pressure control. Well done. So you can see because we've got a nice equal inspiration expiration graph and the sort of rounding on the volume. Um, Anything you'd like to change about this picture? What settings would you alter if you were in charge of this ventilator? Yeah, turn down the rate. So well done. If you look down here at the bottom, it gives us our inspired oxygen concentration. They're breathing 100% oxygen. The 
current PEEP they're on, their rate of breathing that's been set, so that SAMV rate is the minimum rate, and then their tidal volume that they're producing with the pressure of the inside of the mucosa. So they've got an SAMV rate. SIMV rate of 30 and a tidal volume of 180, which is tiny if this is an adult, you'd expect like a 500 mil tidal volume. Or 500 mil. So we want to turn that SIMV rate way down and try and increase her P peep. I put the top here. So her peep is 18. So we're having to give quite a lot of pressure to keep her alveoli open, which is what the peep is doing. And then this 24 number is the total pressure at the top of the breath. So the peak plus whatever we're giving her. So she's only getting about eight centimeters of water extra pressure for her breaths. So I'd probably up that a little bit, drop her SIMB rate, and try and produce a bigger tidal volume for her. Otherwise, good work, guys. Final takeaway message is. Always have a plan for when it goes wrong. Airway management and ventilators are really dangerous bits of kit that save lives, but big sick people need them. So good ones for airway approaches are the ATD, called the um, planning options the UK uses, or Vortex, which is in the US. And this last slide is just um, the plan A to D algorithm, which um, Always communicate with your teammates before any attempts. So all of these slides will be made available for you um, on the Peer Medics website, and this presentation will be uploaded to YouTube. If you want to review it or any review.